Christ commands us to love. Now, if you have cancer and I have the solution for cancer and I don't tell you, then let's be real honest. I don't love you. I don't give a rip about you. If you have cancer and I know the solution for your cancer and I love you, I will tell you that solution. Well, according to Christ, and I agree, you have a disease worse than cancer. I have a disease worse than cancer. I have the disease of sin. It leads to death. We have the solution. The solution is Jesus Christ. He offers to forgive us and to give us the gift of life. So people get honked off because I'm out here telling people about Christ. You really missed the whole point. The reason I'm out here telling people about Christ is for the same reason you tell people about Christ, because we love people. That's what motivates us. I agree. the Inquisition and the Salem Witch Trials and things like that are bad examples because those can be chalked up to the acts of men. But what about when God killed the firstborn, slaughtered the firstborn of the Egyptians? Like he did that, he straight up did. He didn't like command people to do it. People didn't say pe people commanded him to do it. He slaughtered them. Like you said God didn't want the killing of innocent children to happen, yet he killed like a whole generation of people, a whole generation of innocent children. So I don't know how you reconcile this God of wrath with this God of mercy that, mercy that you're preaching. God had morally sufficient reason to judge the Egyptians for the evil that they had done. And he judged him with 10 plagues, the 10th of which was the death of the eldest born son. But God had obviously morally sufficient reason based on what the Egyptians had done to the Jews and the lifestyle that they had embraced, there was morally sufficient reason for him to judge them. You said like when someone makes you angry, but you like repress yourself, that's not what God does. When someone makes God angry, God just like murders them, right? No. God executes justice. And if there justice, is no but God, God also creates justice. That's so correct. God, uh, so like God is above justice because no, he's he creates not above it. justice. His character is just, so he's not above justice. But because but he he's God, he judges. Justice. Pardon? God dictates what justice is. So by definition, anything that God does is just because he defines justice. His character is just throughout eternity. So he does not arbitrarily define justice. But he His could, character is just. No, his character is just. And he remains true to his character, which is just and loving and gracious. But he judges, you're absolutely right. He steps in and judges evil. Now, do you like the alternative? The alternative is, there is no day of judgment. There's no heaven, there's no hell. What does that mean? That means that justice ultimately loses. The good die young. Evil war people win the day. So have the courage intellectually to face the despair of a world where there is no God who judges. Uh, that, that doesn't make me feel despairing at all because I have faith in people. I have faith in people to like act how they should. Like just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean you're going to like decide to murder everyone you know or to like rape people or to pillage villages. Like just because you don't believe in God doesn't mean you have no morality. That's for sure. We all both agree on that one. But if there is no God, your initial point, which was to step out and express moral outrage over God killing the firstborn, of the Egyptians, as an act of judgment, is totally unfounded because you realize there is no God, which means all those children that were killed, tough luck kids, that's the way the ball bounces. And if that's what you believe, then I want to watch you be intellectually consistent and face the despair of your worldview. Well, I believe that that whole debacle like didn't actually happen, so it's not historically relevant. 
I was just bringing up the point that if it did happen, according to the way the Bible says it, then God killed them. But like, All right, otherwise, so forget like the theory, didn't. okay? Today in Sudan and in Afghanistan, some innocent people are getting ripped to shreds. If there is no God, tough luck. That's just the way the wall bounces, you Sudanese and Afghans. And according to your worldview, evil wins. No. How does evil lose? Okay. Evil wins. Evil wins if we assume that God will judge people later. Correct. Evil wins if we assume that God no, will judge Justice people wins. later, and so we don't have to do anything That's about baloney. it now. That's hypocrisy. If I am how is that hypocrisy? We need I'm... to do something about war in the Middle East, about human rights violations. Now we can't trust that God will judge people for them later. That, it, like. That comes down to apathy. That means we don't have to care about it because, like, God cares about it, so we don't have to. It is, like, taking this burden of, like, the real world and, like, throwing it out the window so we don't even have to, like, pay attention. No, quite to the opposite and contrary. If you have a view of heaven, then you know what you should try and make this world to look like. Heaven. If you have no view of heaven, you don't have the faintest idea what to make this world look like because everything's relative. But Stick with your worldview. Be consistent. If you're into relativism, acknowledge there is no perfect world order. There's no thing. There's no way things should be, because there is no should. Remember, you're a relativist. Stick with your philosophy, your worldview. And if you're a relativist, then there's no should or ought. Things just happen. They happen. So whatever happens, happens. That, sir, is what leads to apathy. But if you have a vision of heaven the way things ought to be, should to be, then you're in a position to change this messed up world so that it will look more like heaven will look. I have another question. Yes, sir. Um, why? Like, why would God, like, create the world in the first place? Why? Like, why does there need to be a God? Or why would God, if God is truly all-knowing, and he like knows what's gonna happen before it happens. Right. <laughs> then, what is the point? Well, the point, according to Jesus Christ in the Bible, is that God is not an it. God is not a cosmic engineer. He's a cosmic Father who loves, and He created you and me for the purpose of us living in relationship with Him and in relationship with each other, of respect and love. But do you believe that God has foresight, that God knows what will happen before it happens? Because he's outside of time, he sees past, present, and future at a single glance. Right. So there is like, so everything is going to happen exactly like it's supposed to happen. Like this, God ordained this to happen. God ordained all these people to be here. No. Like, so we might as well say whatever and just like nope. go, along, go with he the He did not ordain me to walk up to this guy, haul back, and slam him in the face. He did not ordain that. But he would if, like, that is what you did. Because, no. Because, like, he's outside of time, so we can only judge what God chose to happen by what does happen. No. He chose to limit his power by giving me a free will. He created this hand for a purpose. There is no free will if he is truly outside of time. But if God knows past, present, and future, why is there any need for him to like create this world, to send us here, to judge us based on our actions, if he already knows what our actions like would have been. All right, I like your use of the word need. You're absolutely right. God does not need Cliff. But God has chosen to love me and to give me a gift of life because he chose to, because he delights in love. And he created me to love him and to love others. And love is not bald in Hollywood. Love is very clearly a decision to work for the well-being of the other person. Okay, but if God's one purpose was to create beings that loved him, then why would he give them free will? Why would he not just create beings that loved him like unconditionally? Great they had question. no choice. Because it's impossible to love if you're not free. That is why the MIT student who dates his computer is a very sad individual. <laughs> Very sad. You have to have a free will in order to love. You take the free will away from a per. If you tried to take the free will away from my, one of my three boys, I'd be all over you like a wet blanket. Why? Because if you take the free will away from a person, you are stripping them of a big part of their humanity. 
<coughs> their free will. That's called brainwashing, right? If you try and brainwash somebody, I'm going to be all over your case. That shows total disrespect trying to brainwash somebody. Because a big part of your humanity is your free will. Okay, so what would you say constitutes brainwashing? I Brain just want to like be clear of what your definition of brainwashing you is before. I think it's possible to manipulate, control, intimidate, and force a person to a place where you have deprived them of their ability to think on their own and you've reduced them to a puppet. Through the use of like media or things like that? Well, that would be a very mild form. Born identity. I'm not a, I'm, All right. I'm not seeing so the whole point. idea of I'm sorry. chemical infusion into a person, injecting a person with chemicals. It's the whole idea of wearing them down through interrogation, through controlling them and manipulating them, and you break a person down. And if you break a person down, and the way you do it subtly is by controlling them. And if I'm incredibly controlling of you and you buy into the first few steps, and if then I can continue this process and have you buy into it, I think I can get you to the point where I am controlling you. That is sick. That is evil because it's a total disrespect of you as a person. So total brainwashing, you're saying, is only possible with the use of chemicals. Is that correct? No, no, no. I'm sorry. That's part of it. It could be part of it. But I've watched it happen with simply a person using intimidation and very sophisticated techniques of beginning to control a person and convincing them that this is really good for them, for you to do exactly what I tell you to do. Right. And then they eventually get to the point where they buy it. Oh, okay, I, I got you. That makes a lot of sense. So what is it besides intimidation if someone tells me I'm going to hell if I don't follow, oh God? What is it besides intimidation if someone tells me I'm internally damned if I do not follow God? What is it besides enticing me it, by saying like, God is the end goal, heaven is this end goal. What is that besides brainwashing if you're using media, if you're using words and ideas to invade the minds of others and like take their will from them? What is that besides brainwashing? He did talk about hell, very little. He talked mainly about love, mainly about integrity, mainly about the kingdom of God and knowing him. But he did know that all of us have a date with death. And he points out, guess what? There's a solution to the problem of death and hell. Eternal life in heaven. Okay. Why don't I play around in traffic? Not because someone's intimidated me, but because I know that if I end up on the bumper of a Mack truck, it's gonna end my life abruptly. So I'm not gonna go out and play in the interstate. Not because I'm scared beyond my ability to think. No, it's because I'm thinking. And I say, you know something? I want to live. I don't want to end up on the bumper of a truck. So I'm not going to go around playing, you know, on the interstate. Okay. All right? Thank you so much. Man. It came to me this morning. Um, I was petting a friend of mine's dog. And I was, I was looking at him, I was like, I love you so much. And then I kind of looked up at him and was like, I really don't like you as much as I like your dog. And, at, and at, I know, horrible. And at that very moment, I had the question, how can I have a more agape love among the world when there's so much negativity and evil? You bet, great question. That's a very good question, because I think it gets right to the core issue that I've been trying to communicate. Love is real because there's a creator God who actually loves, right. which means at the heart of the cosmos is a being who loves. Now, what does that mean? That doesn't mean God loves because of. It means God loves due to his character and often in spite of. And that is what the cross of Christ is all about. God loves you and me in spite of our rebellion against him. Now, when I begin to experience that quality of love from God, I begin to love people in spite of the way they treat me in a dastardly way. That's what Jesus meant when he said, love your enemy. No, I do not have nice feelings 
I do have no positive feelings for my enemy who's hurt me badly. But love is not a positive feeling. It is a decision of the will to work for the well-being of the other person. That is something that comes from my character. It does not come from something you earn. Okay, so if, if love comes from the well-being of me and my character, how long can you continue to love after you've been broken down and beaten and your love's been taken advantage of? How do you continue to find strength in God knowing that it's ultimately right for me to love people right. at the same time you've been stepped on and you've just been done too much to? Okay, two quick points. First point is, the way you experience the power, the way I've experienced the power to love my enemy is by opening myself up more to the love of Christ. That comes through prayer, it comes through quieting myself down in meditation and reflection, it comes from reflecting on the scriptures and on Jesus, that's the first point. The second point, to love does not mean step on me again if you choose. There is such a thing as setting boundaries. So love is not masochistic, oh I love you, to, I, I enjoy it when you hit hurt me, no. And that is why, if you hurt me badly enough, there is probably going to be at least some time that I'm going to remove myself from you, and there will be a boundary. When Jesus says, if someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to them the other also, he's not talking about being a doormat. Just allow people to step on you. Yes, we're to love people and respect people, but no, we don't just sit there and say, oh, hit me again, step on me again. No, we begin to draw boundaries. But don't you think if we draw boundaries, that'll just push us away from the eternal agape love we're trying to create? Good. You're right. It's too easy often to use boundaries as an excuse for rejecting a person and not loving our enemies. Exactly. So we got to watch out. If I've been hurt very, very deeply, it's possible that it's going to take me a while to get to the point where I'm going to want to be in your presence. Let's say that I murder your best friend, all right? Yes, you're going to try and love me. I don't know how often and how soon you're going to want to see my face. And I think that we need to be sensitive to that fact and aware of the fact that if I murder your best friend, we're going to need a time apart. Very much so. Very yeah, much. right. Okay, well... Is the thing I'm, I'm try, I don't know what I'm trying to allude to, but I feel like, like I could be doing more to spread the love among the world. I could be Same doing here. more to just, just yep. to do more. Period. You bet. In the way of agape love, how can I do that? Physically, like I feel like I can only do so much, and I don't know where to start. Okay, and that's a great example of how following Christ is not hear the rules, follow the rules. Instead, following Christ is trusting Him allowing His Holy Spirit to control you. Why is that so important? Because you need discernment. I need discernment. And following Christ is not beating up on yourself because you don't love enough. Rather, following Christ is asking Him for discernment on what it means practically to share your resources with God's unfed children, to stand against evil and injustice, and that's not an easy thing to work through. Living in this kind of complex world that we live in, that takes a truckload of discernment. Yeah. And that's why I'm standing out here not saying, hey, here's the rules, guys, follow the rules. No, I'm pleading with people, put your faith in Jesus Christ, enter a spiritual relationship with Him, learn to meditate, to reflect, to pray, to ask Him for wisdom, to make wise decisions in a very ethically gray world. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And that's also why it's so important for you to be part of a group of believers who are trying to do that. Because often God will speak to you through these people. Let me give you one quick example. If it wouldn't have been for a man who I trust a lot, I would never do what I'm doing now. I grew up in an environment where only idiots do what I do now. Guess you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> But this wonderful man has challenged me and said, Cliff, I've heard these hellfire brimstone preachers who like to stand up on university campuses and tell all the students are going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> now, why don't you, and I see students gather around and listen and get abused. <laughs> I 
He said, why don't you go out and try and present both the love and the truth of Christ? And if it would have been anybody else, I'd have been, I'd have been thinking, you got rocks in your head, man. There's no way I'm ever going to do that. But because I had such respect for the guy, because I knew him very well and because he knew me very well, I said, okay, Leighton, I'll try it. And man, am I ever glad I did. You see, that was a result of me building a friendship with someone who knew Christ, who was a very wise man, who loved me and knew me quite well. And he said, okay, Cliff, what about it? And I'm so glad he did. That was 30 years ago. And well, I'm glad you're here today. Thanks for Thank you so Thank much. You. At times, people say to me, Cliff, all religions are essentially the same. That is about as naive as saying, all white people look the same, all black people look the same, all Chinese people look the same. No, they don't. If I say all white people look the same, it means I'm either not white or I've not taken the time to get to know white people. If I say all black people look the same, it means I'm either not black or I haven't taken the time to get to know black people. And if I say all Chinese people look the same, it means I'm, it means I'm either not Chinese or I have not taken the time to get to know Chinese people. Similarly, the person who says all religions are the same is probably not religious or they have not taken the time to study the major world religions. Another way to put it is, Cliff, when it comes to the superficial issues, there are some differences between the major world religions. But when it comes to the fundamental core beliefs, there's a tremendous similarity. No, in reality, the opposite is true. When it comes to the superficial issues, there is similarity between all the major world religions. But when it comes to the core fundamental issues, there is blatant contradiction clear contradiction. What do I mean? Hinduism teaches that all of reality is one. Therefore, the goal is to escape the illusion that you think you're an individual that is different from me. And the challenge is for you and me to grow in knowledge. Knowledge that distinctions are illusions. We are all essentially one. Jesus Christ insisted false. Jesus Christ insisted that you have a unique individuality, a unique personality that is a gift from God. Don't lose it. Furthermore, Jesus Christ insisted that your body is good, your unique body. It's a gift from God. Take good care of it. In fact, your body is so important that Jesus in the New Testament insists that in heaven you will have a new body to enjoy for eternity. Buddhism is an outstanding religion that talks about how to handle and solve the problem of suffering. And I personally have a tremendous amount of respect for Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. He grew up a very wealthy young man. He turned his back on materialism, lived the life of an ascetic, lived the life of a thinking human being who wanted to figure out how do I alleviate and solve the problem of suffering. His conclusion, though, is fascinating. His conclusion was, Desire causes suffering, therefore the solution to suffering is cut off your desires. Jesus said something radically different. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. In other words, Jesus did not say that desire is wrong. Rather, what he said was, you better learn to distinguish between good desires and bad desires. You had better learn, Jesus said, to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, not to hate, not to seek revenge, not to choose apathy, but instead to love. And to love is to choose to desire the well-being and to work for the well-being and the success of another human being. Islam teaches that there is one God, and I respect Muhammad for his monotheism. I respect Muhammad for the fact that he made one of the five pillars of Islam give alms to the poor. He was an orphan. He benefited from the philanthropy of some very generous people. And so he commanded his followers to give alms to the poor. Jesus also said, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit those who are sick and in prison. Tremendous similarity. But Muhammad clearly taught that Jesus was not God. In the Gospels, unmistakably, Jesus claimed to be God.
Because Muhammad thought that Jesus was a good prophet, he did not accept that Jesus died on a cross, for God would never allow such a horrible thing to happen to such a great prophet. And therefore, not only did Jesus not die on the cross, he didn't rise from the dead. But when you read the eyewitness accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's crystal clear that Jesus predicted his death and he attached ultimate significance to his death. His death is the vehicle through which he paid the penalty, he took the punishment that we human beings deserve for our wrongdoing. Jesus taught that religion is not working your way to heaven. Rather, true religion is accepting God's attempt to reconcile us to himself accepting Jesus Christ and moving into a relationship where you know God. In Islam, God is unknowable. Jesus Christ said, no, this is eternal life, Jesus said in John 17, 3, that we might know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Paul wrote, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Jesus said, come to me, know me, trust in me, and I will give you a relationship with God. I will give you eternal life. Jesus Christ is unique. Jesus Christ is different. And that is why Jesus pointed out that you and I desperately need him. For he is God come to reconcile us to himself. He's God come to solve the ultimate human dilemma, moral failure and death. He's God come to give us eternal life. And when you and I put our faith and trust in Christ, He promises to give us the gift of eternal life. Have you trusted in Him? Have you put your faith in Christ, opened up your life, and allowed Christ to love on you, to forgive you, and to give you the gift of eternal life? God bless you as you, on your own, make that deeply personal decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. I'd love to personally invite you to join us this Sunday for our 9.30 worship service. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Sachs Middle School. I'd love to greet you personally and to talk further with you about what it means to know the living God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for sharing these few minutes with us. Have a great day.